the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everybody. It's been a full jam-packed morning already, uh, but we're about to get into God's word. Uh, For those who didn't catch it, my name is Pat, and I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at City on the Hill. Uh, So before we get into Nehemiah, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this time to gather before your word. We thank you so much for this season that we're in as a church of prayer and fasting. And we pray now as we come to your word, please speak to us. Please uh, give us great insights into your character. Give us great insights into what, who you want us to be as a church. Amen. Well, for those who don't know, the woman who was up here with me before, my wife Carly, is in fact a German. She is a wonderful German woman. Her, she's not just like a little bit German, she's like really German. All four grandparents immigrated to Australia after the war. Uh, they all met through the German Lutheran Church. Uh, her parents then met through the German youth, Lutheran Youth Group. Uh, and so at Carly's place, at her parents' place, they just speak German. Like they are, they are fully, uh, they hold on to that culture in a beautiful way. And what I love about marrying into this family is you kind of get the, the best fruits of this culture. So not only the language, we are seeking to raise our child bilingually, which means Carly and her parents and their family purely speak to Simeon in German. Like he, he speaks German. And I speak to him in the very little broken English that I know. And so and he, we're trying to raise him to have these two great skills. But then we also get the, the benefits of traditions, like around Christmas, we get to uh, uh, do lots of caroling together and singing in the lounge room. It's a really valuable thing. And we also get to kind of have other Christmas traditions on Christmas Eve, where we, we uh, play bocce and all these things, which I'm sure aren't exactly German, but Carly's family loves tradition. And so one of the things that I find really interesting, though, is that uh, her Germanness isn't just in the things that she does, it's in her character. And I don't know if you know this, but Germans are really, really offended by cold feet. They're like extremely offended by cold feet, not just their own cold feet, but anyone's cold feet. So this week, winter hit us in the back of the head, and when I first met Carly, I think I had about three pairs of shoes. I had my going out shoes, I had my runners, and I had my casual shoes. Now I own three pairs of shoes for just inside the house. Like, it's, it's a vendetta against the cold feet of winter. And to be honest, I'm really, really grateful for it. Now, the reason why I tell you this, the reason why I kind of digress at the start of this sermon is because today we're going to see a man who is living in a country of which he doesn't belong. He's living in a country uh, that he is not originally from, and his heart is a longing and yearning for a country that he actually hasn't spent that much time in, hasn't been to, but he's from there. His identity is from there. His affections are from there. See, Carly is very much an Australian citizen, but she has a longing and an affection for Germany, which is really cool. And I know a lot of people here are from other cultures, and you are tied to that culture in a really beautiful way. So today, we're going to be looking at the dual citizen of Susa and Jerusalem. So let's get into the passage, uh, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Halakiah. Now it happened in the month of Chilzev, in the 20th year, I was in Susa, the citadel. So here we have Nehemiah. This book is written in about 445 BC. And as we all know, that in 445 BC, the great superpower was Persia. They have just overthrown the Babylonians. The Babylonians were the great superpower before them who had overthrown and sacked Israel. They had destroyed Jerusalem. Babylon, Babylon had taken all the Israelites out of Jerusalem, almost all of them, and dispersed them around the known world. They were spread everywhere. They had taken the best of them to Babylon. And after Persia had invaded Babylon, Persia took the best of them to places like Susa. Now, Susa is a city where the king of Persia would go for in winter. It is in modern-day Iran, right at the foot of the mountains. You should be able to see it behind me on the screen to the map over to your right. Uh, that's where we are. It's December. Uh, it's about to be winter, and here we meet Nehemiah. See, Nehemiah is a Jewish man who's fi he's found himself working an extremely important job for the king of Persia. We heard in the Bible reading, he is the cupbearer. Now, what this job entailed was tasting the wine, uh, tasting the food and the wine before the king to see if it was okay. 
Now I see a few eyes and ears prick up, and Theophilus starts licking her lips. She thinks, oh, I don't mind the sound of that job, you know. Uh, swan, out of, swan out of bed in the morning, grab my silk robe, wander on into the king's hall, maybe start the day on a Shiraz, <laughs> grab a bit of camembert, a mm, bit of meat. Mm, tastes good, thanks, king. Uh, give a quick nod to the queen, head back to bed, day's work done. That is not what the cupbearer did. See, the cupbearer tasted the, tasted the food and tasted the drink to check it for poison. But you see, the cupbearer wasn't merely an animal that would uh, check it for poison and then die and then be replaced two days later. No, a cupbearer lasted a long time because they were a very trusted advisor to the king. So you would get someone to taste your food if you wanted to trust that person's opinion because you were at risk of also being assassinated if someone went for the king. See, Nehemiah had an important life. He had important responsibilities, but ultimately he was quite comfortable in his role. He was in direct contact with the man in charge of the whole known world. He's living in a very livable situation. You can bet that Susa is winning awards for the Israel's, uh, sorry, Persia's most livable city, because all of the taxes, all of the money from the known world would have landed in here. You can imagine culture, you can imagine comfort, you can imagine decadence, very similar to the city that we live in today. Now, unlike Ezra, who we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks, Nehemiah isn't a religious worker. Rather, he's just working a secular job for a secular boss in a secular city, He's not a key religious figure. He's just like a lot of us here. A lot of us aren't serving in the temple day in, day out like Ezra. You are serving in a secular workplace. You have a secular boss who might not share the same faith and ideas as you. So I pray that as we go through the book of Nehemiah, as we go through this book, you are encouraged as a faithful example as someone who puts God over their work and comfort. Let's read on. Verse 2. We read that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with me, uh, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and, in, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, this brings us to our first question Why is Nehemiah asking about Jerusalem? Why does he care about this outpost of a city? You see, Nehemiah and all Jewish people, a descendant of a man named Abraham. Many years before, Abraham, God promised Abraham that he would have a people, and that people would have a city. That city would be Jerusalem, and God would be with them. He would be living in the city. Jerusalem was crucially important for the Jewish people. And this promise was passed down from Abraham to his son, from his son to his son, and all the way through many generations until they had great kings. They had this great land. They had this great temple. It was basically felt like it was fulfilled. But then we learnt in our series on the kings, didn't we, that God's kings eventually went astray, which led the whole people astray. They kept on turning their back on God and failing God, and eventually Babylon came and sacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and destroyed its walls and put its people in exile. Here we find Nehemiah. He's hundreds of kilometres away, thousands of kilometres away from Jerusalem. And years later, he would have the opportunity to hear about the state of the city that he loves, the state of the city that his heart actually lives in. From verse 3, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So here is Nehemiah and he gets the report about the state of the city that he just so longs for. And the report is bad. Imagine this once great nation, you're living there and day after day you're living in this humiliating city. You've come out of exile, which was embarrassing enough, and now you have to live amongst ruins. Day after day, week after week, year after year, you have to walk to work past the temple that once was, past the walls that once were. And it's a constant reminder of your people and the moment that they failed God. 
What could be Nehemiah's response from hearing about the state of Jerusalem? He could say, guys, I appreciate you telling me what's happening in Jerusalem. I hear you saying that the walls are down. I hear you saying that the people are in trouble. I get it, it's really bad. And I really want to do something about it, but let's be honest for a moment. It's always been like this. I can't see change. It's always, it's never going to happen. It's been 141 years. What are we going to do? Have you ever found yourself saying that? Have you ever found yourself overwhelmed at the enormity of a challenge that you throw your hands up in the air in despair and doubt? Perhaps you are moved by the broken walls that you see in our church, the ongoing challenges of broken relationships and church division, the mishandling of scripture and false teaching that we see throughout movements. Perhaps you're grieved by leaders who have acted poorly and corruptly. Perhaps you're broken by believers who seem lukewarm in their faith and unmoved in their worship. Perhaps you're frustrated by the consumerism that plagues our churches. You notice that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are so few because of this. But perhaps, might me, you're burdened by the many people who are lost in our actual city who don't know Jesus. My heart breaks knowing that the majority of our city doesn't know Jesus. Less than 10% of people are part of worshipping communities, have that moment to dedicate their kids into a church. They have jobs, they have houses, but they are looking at an eternity without God. We can know this and we can feel this, but knowing and feeling isn't the same as doing anything about it, is it? For some of us, we deny it, we are apathetic towards us, towards it, but for many of us, it's just the enormity of the situation that makes us feel like we can't do anything. We hear ourselves saying, this could never be turned around, I can't make a difference, the walls of this city are just a bit too broken. But what about Nehemiah? What is Nehemiah's response? Let's read from verse 4 and see the response of Nehemiah. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I, know, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants." confessing the sins of the people of Israel which have sinned against you. You see, I think this is the most amazing response from Nehemiah. He doesn't retreat, he doesn't ignore, he doesn't justify, rather he sits down and he weeps. He weeps for the people of the city and he weeps for the city itself, the city that is in tatters, the city that he is likely never visited. He weeps, he prays, He fasts. We see a similar response in Ezra last week when he was moved to grief at the state of Israel's sin. He turns in fasting and in praying. You see, church, this is the right response to hardship. It is so easy for us to pray in times of prosperity. Thank you, God, for another great day. But could you imagine Israel here? They feel like God's plan has been foiled or God has abandoned his plan. This shows an incredibly deep faith and understanding of the character of God from Nehemiah. He mourns, he fasts, he brings his grief to God rather than swallowing it, swallowing it and trying to deal with it himself. You see, fasting was a really common practice in the Old Testament and it was an assumed practice in the New Testament as well. It's going without something for a time, especially food, in, during a time of mourning that to heighten your dependence on God, for, to have that hunger to drive you deeper in prayer. We see that it's often done in long, considered times of prayer in the Bible, like this time. Here it is driving Nehemiah to deeper prayer for, and confession for his people. 
I think it's also n- worth noting Nehemiah's deep understanding of God that we see in the opening lines of his prayer. Notice it with me. Because for Nehemiah, he knows that nothing is out of reach for God. Nothing is too big for God. God is great, he says, and awesome. That means he's sovereign and righteous. He is powerful to save. Nehemiah doesn't go to God with blind hope. He doesn't go to God hoping that maybe he can do something. He goes to God confident in what God can do for his people in the future. And we see this prayer is littered with scripture, with adoration, with thanksgiving to God, with confession for his sins personally, but also on behalf of his nation. It, this prayer is an appeal to God to use him in this situation, to save his people through him. And I think this is such an incredible response for a city that he's never visited. Nehemiah's prayer to God ultimately that God would grant him success in the dangerous plan that he's about to enact in the dangerous plan that he's about to do. He's praying for boldness. Nehemiah is praying boldly. So let's pick up the narrative in chapter 2, if you're still following along, as we look at the action of Nehemiah. From chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. So the month of Nissan is roughly April. So here we know it wasn't just a flash in the pan prayer by Nehemiah. He's been praying and fasting for four months. For four months, his heart has been moved for his people. I'm immediately impressed by Nehemiah here because I can stick to a new running plan or a diet for about a week. So my admiration is very high. Notice that Nehemiah hasn't been sad in the king's presence before. This isn't because Nehemiah was some great giant optimist who was always positive all the time. This was because to be sad in the king's presence was to risk your life because it reflected badly on the king. If you were going to be sad in the king's presence, then the king would take it offense and kill you. But we see miraculously that rather than punishment, the king, uh, the king asks how Nehemiah is going, why he is sad. And Nehemiah could have had one of two responses here. He could have cowardly said, um, everything's fine, nothing's wrong with me, it's all good. Or, in boldness and in courage, he could be honest. And in verse 3 we see, he says, I said to my king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when my city and where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? This was a huge, huge risk for Nehemiah as highlighting that he cares about an outpost city of the king's land comes across as disloyalty. This could come across as not only being sad in front of the king but upset about something the king has direct responsibility over. This was such a risk for Nehemiah, we must see this. He is sticking his neck quite literally out for people who he's never met. He could be killed for such a comment to his boss. Forget chastised, forget fired, forget cancelled, murdered. This was life on the line stuff. So what gave Nehemiah this kind of confidence? What gave him this kind of boldness? Faith. Nehemiah had been praying and fasting, so he was emboldened in faith. What I also find remarkable is that Nehemiah is risking such a high position of comfort to advocate on behalf of these people. He's deliberately putting himself in a position of discomfort. He's getting in there, in the trenches, to help carry his people's burdens. See, Nehemiah prays to leave the comfort that he's in to carry the burdens of his people. And I think this is a challenge for us because we like to think that we're keen to help. But are we actually okay as a church to burden ourselves? Are we actually good at putting the burdens of another on ourselves? You see, to help carry someone's burden is to help carry some of the weight on it. Imagine that I'm holding a log. 
Maybe it's 50 kilos. To come and carry some of the burden is to take a couple of kilos. Maybe it's 10%. Maybe it's 20%. Maybe it's 50%. But if you're helping me carry this log, you are going to feel some of the weight of this log. Nehemiah asks to leave to carry other people's burdens. And during this time of prayer and fasting as a church, I pray that we are looking out for how we as a community can help carry the burdens of our society. My prayer as a church is for our church that we strive to choose to lift the burdens of those who are in our city that are being crushed by its weight, that are feeling like it's too heavy. And that means we're also going to feel the pressure that they're carrying. In Jordan Dixon's great book, Bullies and Saints, he goes through chapter by chapter exploring different seasons of the church. It's really good. I'd commend it to you. Some of the most horrendous things that the church has ever done, he looks at, like genocides, like crusades, like abuse. And he also goes through some really amazing stuff that they've done, like helping the poor, public health systems, universities, and advocation for people without a voice. In one chapter that I find super confronting, is a, he's looking at the church in the early first century. And in, it, there's, in, his, in this chapter, there's an excerpt from a letter from a Roman soldier back home to his wife. And the Roman soldier is saying, uh, basically responding to her request, he's saying money is on the way. And he's responding to her news that she is pregnant. And he says, in a very off-the-cuff comment, above all, If you bear the child and it's a male, take care of it. And if it's a female, cast it out. This is a horrendous line for us to read today. But this was common practice of family planning in the Roman city. If the child was born undesirably to the parents, they would take that child and they would leave it on a garbage tip to die of exposure, to be eaten by a wild animal or to be picked up by a human trafficker. This was because they couldn't bring home someone that was going to burden the rest of the household. It's incredibly sad. Because to have a child who was disabled, if they were a woman and they weren't able to bring in the income in that time, in that society, then they were going to be a burden on that household. But the Christian church in Rome gained this insane reputation for going to the rubbish dumps, picking up these children taking them home and raising them. They were taking on the burdens that no one else wanted because they were driven by the imago Deo, the fact that all humans have have the right of dignity and respect because they are image bearers of God. We are different to animals. So radically, the church took on the burdens of the people of Rome, especially those who were unwanted. Church, our city right now, has a lot of people who are really burdened. Homelessness is a huge problem and it's growing. Domestic violence is a huge problem and it's growing. Our addiction to gambling is one of the biggest the world has ever seen. And guess what? It's a huge problem and it's growing. Loneliness is an epidemic that is plaguing our society with 30% of people at the moment, right now, in Melbourne, living alone. It's a big problem and it's growing. So during this time of prayer and fasting, may I encourage you to spend some time thinking of the mercy ministries of our church, thinking about how God can use us. How will he use you? How will he use you to get involved in the messiness of people's lives? How can we burden ourselves with the burdens of other people? Maybe it's through our skills as an educated community to provide education to those who don't have access to it. Is it to feed those who are hungry? Is it to house those who are homeless? Is it to advocate for those who are vulnerable? Maybe it's to befriend those who are lonely. Church, let's pray big. Let's pray massive like Nehemiah. Let's pray huge and see what God does. Because we know no matter how much we think we care for people, God cares more. Because like me and Nehemiah, we can, grow, we can pray in the confidence that we know the character of God. 
We know that he can use us in the most amazing ways to, if we just for a second take our heads out of thinking about ourselves and incline our ear to him in prayer and fasting. Church, as we kind of close the book on the first chapter of Nehemiah, one, I just want to say that one thing we're going to be asking through this whole series is how can we be like Nehemiah? And that is going to be the wrong question to ask of this book. We can glean great habits like we have of prayer from this letter. We can look at the character and motivation, but the reality is, is that if all we focus on is Nehemiah, then we are going to miss the main point of this book. So let's turn our attention finally to the the main character of this book, the greater cupbearer, the Nehemiah. So I know when I read this story, I don't know about you, but I see a man stepping out of comfort and prominence to save a broken and disheveled city. I see the character who I resonate most with is unequivocally the city of Jerusalem and not the man of Nehemiah. You see, when I look at Israel, I see a broken city. I see a broken people. I see citizens that have fallen short of the ways of God, who are torn down, who are battered, who are beaten, who are in desperate need of something more. I see a nation that needs to be rebuilt and restored. Nehemiah is going to head off to save Israel and rebuild it. But ultimately, we're going to see that his attempts to save the city are going to fail abysmally. Sorry to spoil the ending of the book for you. Nehemiah is going to try to reform, he's going to try to restore, but ultimately he's going to fail. But this whole book points to the one who won't fail in this role. This whole book points to the greater cupbearer who is Jesus. See, Nehemiah sat in a high position of comfort and he left it to carry the burdens of his other people. But Jesus sat in the thrones of heavens and made himself the lowest of the lowly to save us. Nehemiah's heart stirred at the state of his people. Jesus came into this world because his affections for his his flock are so strong. Nehemiah's final response was to pray. Jesus modelled a life of total prayerful dependence. Nehemiah's intercession for the people is prefiguring Christ's intercession for us before God the Father. Nehemiah did what God put on his heart. Christ honoured God with full, perfect obedience. But in the end, as we're going to find out, Nehemiah ultimately failed to reform and restore. Christ is the final reformation, the final restoration of anyone who wants to be a part of God's people. If you're sitting here today and you aren't one of God's people, I want to issue an invite to you right here, right now. Please become one. God has his arm stretched out for you. He is knocking at your door. Let him in. When you look at your life and you feel burdened, please don't try to soldier on alone. God sent Jesus to help you carry the burdens that you're dealing with right now. If you're sitting here thinking, Pat, this is impossible for me. You have no idea of who I am. You have no idea of the things I've done. You have no idea of the mess I've made. You have no idea of the person I am when no one is looking. Well, I assure you that God knows you. He sees you because of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. He forgives you. He's not work, you know, there's no work that you need to do to earn your salvation from him. There's no church attendance that you need to hit, no KPIs, nothing. Jesus is a free gift for you to be a part of God's people. All you need to do is put your faith, your hope, and your trust in him today. Let him lift the burdens off you. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing two songs. I'm going to invite the band up. And in these songs, we don't just sing these songs because they're nice to sing. We don't sing them because they feel good. No, in these songs, re-surrender and promises, we're going to be declaring truths. 
We're going to have an opportunity to re-surrender our life to Jesus. We're going to have an opportunity to sing of the promises of God that are reflected in the prayer of Nehemiah. So if you want to re-surrender your life for the first time, I'm going to pray for you right now. And if you want specific prayer, please just stick your hand up while everybody's got their eyes closed. And then we're going to sing of these truths. So please take a moment, bow your heads and pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the free gift of grace that is Jesus. We praise you that he is the ultimate cupbearer, the ultimate advocate for us, the ultimate person with the king's ear. Father, we praise you so much for the gift of grace that he is. We thank you for the way that he lifts our burdens and takes on our hardships. Lord, would you please help us to re-surrender our lives to you today. Help us to declare your promises anew today. Father, without you, we can do nothing. Please stir our hearts for the brokenness of this city. Please stir our hearts for those who are being crushed by the burdens in this city. May you use us, your faithful servants, to do something radical in this city. Please help us to not think much of ourselves, but think of ourselves less. Father, please be with us now as we sing praises. Amen.